edible is it's a very fuzzy boundary. And like, I mean, the U is a great example. It's mostly very poisonous, except for this one little thing where if you eat like the little sort of jelly around the seed, which is also extremely uh, poisonous. Um, so, you know, it's like a tiny little piece that's edible. And then there's lots of other things that might be edible if they're processed correctly. And that also that usually means maybe, you know, re un unearthing some old knowledge about how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, or whether that means making it at least palatable and edible. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi, an activist and cause marketer who's passionate about social impact, sustainability, and regeneration. As many of you know, I have worked to create a five-step activist guide to help you unleash your inner activist. All you have to do is visit my website, caremorebebetter.com, and join the email list. As soon as you do so, you'll get a welcome email, including a link to download the guide. Today, I'm finally going to get to dig a little bit deeper into two things we covered in our regeneration series as we meet Ethan Welty. Ethan is a postdoctoral researcher at the World Glacier Monitoring Service and University of Zurich. He's a photographer and also the co-founder of Falling Fruit, a technology-focused 501c3 nonprofit organization that's mapping the world's edible plants. They have developed an online platform to promote urban foraging and local food. This is so awesome. I'm honestly a little thrilled I get to talk about this today. Ethan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Karina. Well, I'm thrilled you're here. And as we get to jump into this discussion on urban foraging, guerrilla gardening, and local food, I'd love to learn more about what you're presently doing in your postdoctoral research. Something ra rather very different, actually. Um, my life had been kind of following parallel paths. And so I've been, I have this background in math and physics, and then I got involved in environmental science more generally and um, did my PhD on glaciers uh, using time lapse photography to look at uh, rapid glacier retreat and you know the rapid changes to landscapes with climate change. And so now I just um, recently landed in Switzerland um, to continue that work. Um, so I'm, I'm essentially, a, I'm basically a programmer uh, for the World Glacier Monitoring Service. So I'm helping them to uh, better manage submissions of glacier observations around the world. Um, so there's um, scientists in, in countries, in every country that has glaciers um, and has people studying glaciers, they're reporting back their observations. And then the World Glacier Monitoring Service uh, compiles them for use for, uh, for analysis, for reporting to governments, uh, to the UN and, and other sort of larger international bodies. So it sounds like you got to combine a couple of things here, your love of photography and also of research um, as you did your undergrad work and now in your postdoctorate fellowship, correct? Yeah, and there's there's th other, some other themes too. There's um, definitely the more sort of technical, you know, sort of computer science side. Um, I, for whatever reason, I've been drawn to projects I can build with those skills, um, and also geography. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was also a, a passion that's that's played out in different ways, whether that's mapping glaciers or that's mapping edible plants. <laughs> <laughs> It's, well, yeah. using technology to better our lives, so to speak. I spent a bit of time poking around the website and it's quite simple, but also I was surprised to see how many fruit trees in my neighborhood aren't locked as a, for example. Oh. So I plan to go in there and actually add the lemon trees. There's a couple of what look like volunteer plum trees in my neighborhood as well. And I will mm. say that the fruit they produce is kind of more pit than fruit, but <laughs> maybe they need a little help. <laughs> they can make a great jam. If somebody wanted to volunteer water them, I'm sure they would do much better. And so I've been looking at all of those things too in my own community 
there are a couple plots of land that I think might even be really suitable for a guerrilla gardening project. But, uh, you know, there's, of course, some legalities or if you can actually get permission from the city to do things like that, that can actually be another way to turn unused land into a food source for your community. So yeah. mm -hmm. I was hoping That's you right. could just talk about how you founded Falling Fruit with your co-founders, like what led to it? How'd you get here? And where do you see it going from here? Sure. I think all myself and my co-founders all have slightly different stories of our origin, um, but they all share this, this theme that you know, we, in different ways, we came to the realization that there was a lot of food growing in our neighborhoods. For me, I had this mental switch when I, I started to make, uh, I was making beer. I moved to Boulder, Colorado for graduate school. Um, I, I was brewing beer. I then also started to make uh, apple cider. Um, and that meant finding apples for my apple press. And so that led me to wanting larger volumes of apples than I could provide for myself from the, the trees in, in the yard of the house I was living in. And some friends introduced me to some apple trees they had spotted from the bike trail. And, and, and I think just this switch in my mind that I, when I went from the city is someplace that's separate from where the food comes from to this realization that, oh, the, the city is an environment where there, you know, there could be food if only I, I look. Suddenly, I, I, I just saw much more than I, that I had missed over the years. So I started to see the city very differently and noticed details that I had missed. And, and as I got really into, into it, I was also realizing that it's quite a bit of work to keep track um, because unlike um, you know commercial uh, orchard, say, um, every tree is on, on its own schedule. Uh, there might be many different varieties. I had this sort of paper. This is before I had a, I was very organized <laughs> with you know modern technology. So I had like everything separate, like the notepad and the handheld GPS and a camera and trying to keep track of all of these different places. Um, and I got quite good at it. So I was no longer, this is, so this would have been in 2012 sometime. And by that fall, I was getting all the fruit I needed from the, you know, the, the streets of Boulder. But I also was noticing that I was the only person doing this. And so I thought, well, that's a missed opportunity because there's actually quite a lot here. Um, it's quite a lot of fun. And, and people seem very surprised. I would easily blow people's minds with, by just picking a chair or an apple off a tree. Like that was, <laughs> that's all it took. And so people were not noticing. They hadn't had that switch. In their mind, I thought, oh, maybe, uh, maybe I could find a way to share this project with, with others. And I was, actually it was through another program in Boulder called Boulder Food Rescue, which is a retail level uh, food rescue organization. I was wanting to volunteer with them. And I, I'm at that meeting, I met the, a co-founder of Boulder Food Rescue, who also was very into foraging and had the, same, had the same experiences and thought, hey, we should build a platform. And, and so we partnered together, that was Caleb Phillips. And he's a computer scientist through and through um, and had all the skills that I, at, certainly at the time, did not have. And together we got to work and many sleepless <laughs> nights later, I feel like, um, I think it was about three months we launched Falling Fruit in March, 2013, based more or less how you see it now. So yeah, that was kind of my, my journey. And, oh, and I, I, I want to add one element that really shaped the project was I had gone my hands on the city of Boulder's tree inventory, actually from a, a different project. And I thought, hey, this is, you know, the city arborists, uh, they've already gone through the trouble of, of mapping all these trees on, on, you know, city streets, in the parks, their location, precise location, and their, the species, or maybe even the cultivars, you know, I can use this <laughs> as a forager, as a tech forager. Mm -hmm. um, so I was using that as, at least as an initial guess for- It is more exposed and the other side is more deep creviced, like mountainous range, right? So you have two very different climates that kind of come together here. And as you walk around the neighborhood, I have neighbors who have planted grapes that they're really purely ornamental, like they don't do anything with it, but it climbs up a trellis and they let the fruit just fall. Mm -hmm. And a good part of that 
um, vine is actually over the fence. And so when it's ripe, I pick them and take them home to my family. It's the same thing with plum trees, pomegranate, apple, and pear in my neighborhood. A lot of people just don't care about the stuff that's on the side of the fence and it falls. And I imagine it's the same story on the inside of their yards. So I've been kind of debating on at what point I kind of just go door knock and say, are you uh, open to like letting me come in and harvest your tree. Um, I think that'd be great. I've also done similar things in the past where I had a friend who had an apple tree in their yard. It was like a very old apple, very tall. We lost it in a storm and it ended up splitting. It had to be cut down. Um, but we would get incredible yields from that fruit tree. I would literally be climbing the branches and shaking it to the uh, apples would fall and then we'd press everything right then. So it wouldn't matter if it got like minutely bruised because you're running the press literally right in the yard and making cider with your friends. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've just been involved in some of this stuff over the years and always felt like it didn't make a lot of sense that we spend all this money as different municipalities planting trees and shrubs and other sorts of plants that don't produce a yield that are in public spaces and that could be put some, you know, you could put something else like instead of a poisonous shrub, like the oleander, which is everywhere, you could plant a strawberry tree, which is kind of a bush that mm -hmm. has a fruit that you can eat. That's edible that the birds eat, that people eat. I mean, I've shown my kids that these are delicious fruits. And so I've picked them with them and they're like, oh, it's really, it tastes great. And it's a great source of vitamin C. And it's something that you can't just go and buy at a typical grocery store. It's it's a way to kind of teach people to be more engaged with the nutrition that they're bringing into their bodies, to get kids involved and in thinking about where food comes from. And to me, it just makes so much more sense to consider even working with our local cities to, to plant edible plants as opposed to just ornamentals in different areas. Yeah. I mean, I think you've touched on the, a long, the main long-term mission here of, mm -hmm. of the Falling Fruit Project. Yeah, of course, it's, you know, first and foremost, it's a tool for individual foragers, but it was really, I really think of it as a, as a way to reimagine what cities can provide us. I, I'm not claiming that, you know, we can grow all the food that we need inside the city. I don't think that would actually necessarily be a very efficient way to approach the problem. But as you pointed out, like there's all these benefits, right, to sharing mm -hmm. our city with um, food bearing plants that are both, um, you know, for nutrition, but also for community, for um, for education, for just understanding where food comes from and like, a, you know, greater botanical knowledge and the cycles of nature and like all, there's all these things. And and so I, you know, I see our role a little bit to, you know, here's what's already in most of the time accidentally already available in your city, mm -hmm. right? Maybe because in some landscaping, some, some, some food bearing species snuck through and, and made the cut. And um, so, go, you know, go and harvest them. But imagine, of course, okay, well, the, yeah, as you, know, as you point out, all the other plants, that's not the case. Imagine if all of the trees in the city were, you know, food bearing in some way, why not? There's a lot of reasons for the why not. There's a lot of uh, squeamishness. I think around the commons, you know, like, oh, well then if we have this abundance then maybe someone will get more than their fair share. You know, these ideas about, um, there's sort of fear that someone might get more than they deserve. There's, there's definitely classism around forging and it's how it's seen as you know, kind of lower class or admitting to being hungry or something. Um, and also sort of bringing in kind of mixing the urban with the, with the rural in a way that, a lot of some people who are in the cities are are less so, but you know, sort of wanting those worlds to be kept separate. And then there's also just some really practical concerns, uh, mostly from the, from the cities about, well, is it is it going to make a mess if people don't harvest? You know, there's there is a gap, or there could be a gap between the the supply and the demand. Right now, there's a big supply and no demand. Uh, we're working on there to be a big, uh, you know, a, or a, a mod, let's say a moderate supply and a, and a, a no demand. <laughs> Uh, we're trying to get the, the demand up to meet the supply mm -hmm. so that then hopefully uh, we can have really start a conversation with cities and say, well, you know, the residents of your city have met the supply. <laughs> uh, let's now talk about growing the, you know, growing the supply um, as the demand grows. 
so these are the, these are the really big picture ideas, and that's something I would I would love to have more 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 time for. Honestly, is really starting to work with city governments because that's going to be the way to really change the landscape of you know of our urban environments. They're the ones making those decisions, you know, with guidance from all of us. But we have to we have to be uh, make our desires known, and and that means also getting more people on board um, mm -hmm. with this vision of of the city. I, I have some <laughs> some thoughts around all of these things, um, both from my personal life and also just from, okay, so my father's a landscape architect, right? And so he has mostly worked um, in the business and very high-end residential world, right? And what he has commonly seen is that people have a reticence to place or to plant fruiting trees and fruiting plants because they tend to attract more birds and squirrels and things like that, that they may just consider pests. Oh, <laughs> or, sounds lovely to me. <laughs> yeah. Or they're worried about the, the tree fall or, or just, you know, having all the fruit fall to the ground and make a mess. Now, the one case in which I completely agree with that is probably the olive tree, because every time you see an olive tree planted, they bear a ton of fruit. And if they are not actually harvested, ends up on the sidewalk, it stains the sidewalk, it's hard to clean up. Mm -hmm. So there are certain instances where I think, okay, that makes sense from a city perspective. Why would you want to plant a bunch of olive trees that most people aren't going to go and just forage? Right. They, first of all, don't necessarily Depends identify. You they yeah, might not, I mean, in, in they like, don't know what's um, an olive, you know, Israel and then they don't know, they don't places, know how to yeah. process it or they don't, right. they think that you have to like do all this work to marinate it or get the oil out or whatever. So they just mm -hmm. let it kind of drop to the ground. Whereas if that was an apple tree or a pomegranate or something else, they'd be more likely to grab it and say, oh, well, look at this delicious snack here. Um, right. so, I recognize this from the, from the store. It's yeah, like, you don't right. need more education. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. It. Yeah. Or something like the strawberry tree, which a lot of people don't know is food. They just mm -hmm. think it's some fruiting bush that, you know, Hey, commonly, if you see a fruiting bush and it's got red berries on it of any sort, you think it's poisonous. So you don't touch it. Now, having a dad who is a landscape architect, he taught me about plants. He's like, oh, this is a fruit. And like, I like to use these in different projects that I um, work on in Silicon Valley because they do well in the, the environment. They don't take much maintenance. You don't have to water them much and they produce fruit. So you get, you know, birds that will eat them. And if you want to pick it, you can pick it yourself too. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, great. You know, that sounds like a really good solution. Why don't we have more of that? Why do we continue to place oleander everywhere you could possibly think of when oleander is actually poisonous? And my own husband once actually consumed some and ended up in the hospital as like a three-year-old, wow. you know? This is, it's a reality. Like um, when it's used mm -hmm. so much as an ornamental bush, you know, kids put things in their mouth and, and can right. end up, you know, I, in serious trouble. I, I'm amazed. Um, there's a lot of you planted uh, landscaping, at least at least in Switzerland, which there is, you know, like 0.01% of the tree is edible and the rest is extremely poisonous. So it's like, you know, it's a strange choice. <laughs> <laughs> what is a you? A you, uh, uh, Taxus genus, right? There are these very deep green, evergreen, they look like almost Christmassy evergreens mm. like extremely waxy deep green and they have these arils so not technically a fruit that the it's like pink colored that wraps a seed and mm -hmm. so this is like pink these little pink dots on a very very gr dark green background they're very common ornamental here um and they're they're one of the most poisonous plants in the world <laughs> i mean like you can yeah there's all these crazy stories of archers that you know they made bows out of the wood and they would die from poisoning over time from like from the, just from just handling the it. wood yeah. um yeah. livestock dying uh when like you know you're trimming the trimmings are thrown over into a field and they ate it and collapsed and, i mean yeah another aspect of that you you touch on is of course that there's you know edible is it's a very fuzzy boundary and like mm -hmm. i mean the you is a great example it's mostly very poison except for this one little thing where if you eat like the little sort of jelly around the seed which is also extremely uh, poisonous um, so you know it's just like a tiny little piece that's edible and then there's lots of other things that might be edible if they're processed correctly and that also that usually means maybe you know re 
un unearthing some old knowledge about how to do that, um, mm -hmm. you know, or whether that means making it at least palatable and edible. Those the two things <laughs> often are, are necessary. Ultimately, we see that a little bit on the, on the platform. There's always been this tension or t challenge, I guess. Um, you know, there's there's people using the platform. They're extremely knowledgeable and are adding things like you sometimes actually who like to suck on the yellow the pink part and then there's other people who are you know more beginner and are relying on kind of getting their their getting their their lips <laughs> get the, getting their lips on on some some <laughs> tasty fruit that without like having to really go out of their comfort zones right away and and um, try out you know plums and apricots and mulberries and and things that you know are are pretty easy to identify and so we've tried to we tr we try to really cast a wide net you know what is edible um to whom and so does that mean that you know all, all maple trees are technically all edible if you want to tap them for maple you know for for maple syrup um mm -hmm. and some people do that and others would think that's absurd um <laughs> on the map so what it takes yeah. a bucket and a spigot <laughs> and uh you know you have to go and check it <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I have heard, um, I listened to a few podcasts that are in the space of kind of considering how you build this, this new world that we might seek to create, where food is more readily abundant, where fruit trees are the norm, as opposed to something that is just ornamental, because of the fact that, yeah, you know, cities will invest in watering them initially, but after their roots are established, you don't really need to water them. And they can produce fruit and they can feed, well, yes, the squirrels and the birds, which I contend with um, in my own garden, but also just produce something that's viable, that's nutritious, and that can be harvested by anybody who happens to be passing by. So I think that would be a more healthy space. And one of them is It Could Happen Here that's led by Robert Evans. And they had a discussion mm -hmm. that was pretty deep about guerrilla gardening and what it is and how you can, you know, choose a plot of land that nobody necessarily is working to maintain and, you know, do something as simple as toss some seeds or bury some pits or even go as far as getting a sapling and planting it and doing something like wearing an orange vest. Because if you wear an orange vest, everyone assumes that you're there to do work that you're something supposed to official. be doing, right? And trip. I'm like, well, this is really creative. And I started to imagine, you know, the streets of Scotts Valley where we have some ornamentals planted along the side of the road. And one of the things they actually talked about is even replacing something that has recently been planted by the city. And I'm like, you know, you'd probably get in trouble for doing something like that. But it just raises the question of, you know, what choices would you even make in your own yard? Like if you have a yard that you have some soil in and you're choosing to plant a tree, why not choose a fruiting tree as opposed to a non-fruiting tree? When we moved into our house here, uh, they had chosen a non-fruiting cherry in the front yard. It's a beautiful tree, creates beautiful mm. flowers every year. Every time I see it bloom, I wish it would actually fruit. Right. But right. wishing doesn't make it happen. I might see two or three cherries that fall to the ground always before they're even palatable because it's not meant to fruit anyway. Right. And ultimately, it just creates a beautiful mess when all the, the little petals fall to the ground, but no fruit in the end. Mm -hmm. And so I just think even making those small choices. You know, I planted a Fuji apple in my backyard because it's self-fruitful and you don't need to have two of them. I then planted two pluots and only one of them for some reason will ever flower, even though the other is grown ginormous and I do fertilize it. Um, because only one of them ever actually flowered, I had to get a third plum to be able to make it um, uh -huh. go ahead and produce fruit. So now I have a Santa Rosa plum, a pluot, and another pluot that's just a beautiful shade tree. <laughs> so, you know, who knows? Maybe they um, there was some mix up and they actually didn't give me a plum. I don't know. But <laughs> at the end of the day, I've got you know, the trees that I've chosen to plant in my yard are fruitful. My father gave me a pomegranate as my graduation present in June. I just received my MBA from Santa Clara University and he came to my house with a pomegranate and I chose to plant it on the front edge of my yard because I thought when it gets big, 
I am probably not going to be able to consume all of its fruit in a time that will be manageable. So I'll plant it on the front edge of my property and I will put it on fallingfruit.org. Yay, perfect. <laughs> and, and then people in my community can come and um, harvest the pomegranate. I think that's, yeah, it's a lovely idea. And I think it's an, a great strategy because, you know, it's rather get help, right, with, with mm -hmm. the harvest, especially in a space where you don't have to coordinate. There's so many fruit trees producing an over, overwhelming amount of fruit for their owners on private property. And so there's a whole there's a whole class of organizations built around that issue, um, right, of how do we, okay, so the, I mean, falling fruit can, can help the individual forager kind of around the edges, you know, and in, in all of the public spaces and kind of on the boundaries uh, with private land. But what about all the things, you know, it, it takes a bit more coordination to, you know, get permission and off, you know, then you're talking about a large volume, a lot more food unlocked that way. And so typically that's taken care of by all these different organizations that are, you know, doing urban gleaning. So coordinating volunteers, um, with, uh, with landowners, um, getting access to the resource, harvesting, sharing the, you know, sharing the harvest around the community. Um, there's one that we helped start in, in Boulder because basically because falling fruit didn't address this really. Um, and there was a need, uh, called community fruit rescue, which is still going, although I'm not, I'm not involved anymore. And there actually the, the issue, another benefit of making sure that all of those private trees were harvested. Um, was not because of squirrels, but because of bears, <laughs> which on in mountain sort of mountain bordering communities is an interesting topic. Uh, there's a few other places like the United States. Well, there was a program in Squamish in Canada and British Columbia. I'm not sure if they're still active. And then in, um, I believe in Missoula, Montana, where there's there was this direct connection made between sort of bear conservation and uh, forage, urban foraging, um, mm. where you're not wanting to attract, you don't want the bears to come into the city because that usually ends badly for the bears. Mm -hmm. Um, and after garbage, you know, once you've secured all the garbage cans and, and you know, you, you use, um, bear proof, um, uh, the trash bear bins and compost and bear bins. boxes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Once mm -hmm. you have that, then you, the next tier to take care of is actually the fruit trees. That was certainly been the case in, yeah, in Montana and in Colorado. And so, um, there's also that benefit to making sure that we're, you know, we're harvesting all of the, all of the fruit. There's another st gorilla strategy, which you didn't mention, but I, I feel it should be mentioned is gorilla grafting, um, where you don't, so you wouldn't have to remove the whole tree. You would just, if it's, if it's a, a good rootstock. So, and well, for example, that cherry tree, the decorative cherry tree is, you know, genetically more than capable, I'm sure of hosting. Uh, a fruiting cherry. I'm going to do that uh, this year. Graph. It's happening. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's why if anyone is wondering, like you know, on Falling Fruit, you can use it as a platform for also finding um, non-fruiting, but uh, graftable uh, varieties. You've just convinced me. Um, so I could actually take, yeah, I can, I can take branches from my existing Santa Rosa plum and the other pluot and graft it onto the non-fruiting one in the backyard. And that, yeah, maybe. Is that one just never flowering either, though? It that, flowers that like barely. <laughs> it only it wrong. only produces like, I don't know, like 15 flowers or something ridiculous mm -hmm. when it goes into bloom. I don't understand why. I haven't figured it out. And I am unfortunately not. I am. My knowledge of, you know, agroforestry is, <laughs> is not not nearly where i wish it were um so that i would defer that to someone else <laughs> to weigh yeah the other two produce an abundance of you know they bloom like crazy so it's it's just interesting i wonder if it's like the trees communicating under the ground with their roots or something and it, like i i don't know it's like, just oh you have it covered so i, I can take it easy <laughs> yeah ex i don't know it doesn't make any sense to me for all intents and purposes it absolutely looks like a pluot it just won't fruit mysterious yeah mysterious so pluots for those that are listening and may not know pluots are basically a plum apricot hybrid and so they produce a sweeter plum um but that uh, has a little it's a little fleshier than uh, what you might be used to from a standard plum and so they're delicious and uh they tend to produce more fruit than an apricot tree will in my climate so that's why i chose pluots as opposed to apricots 
did you see anything in your neighborhood on on the falling fruit map that you didn't recognize or that like the name of no no so i mean i i saw yet. the technical term for the strawberry tree which i didn't know i just knew they were called strawberry bushes or strawberry tree which i thought was really cool there were really not that many it was mostly lemon like a lot of people are listing lemon and lots of citrus <laughs> yeah <laughs> because your... mm -hmm. people plant a meyer lemon and they don't realize how much fruit they're going to get and it's also kind of thorny and difficult to get inside the branches and so some people just won't harvest half of the tree for that reason and so um, one of the things that we do if we're going to host a big party and we decide we want to make lemon drops, <laughs> um, friends will like literally just ask around the neighborhood, hey, do you mind if I come harvest your lemon tree and get like 50 lemons off of a single bush? So that's kind of incredible. One thing I have noticed during this pandemic time, the lemon trees in my neighborhood are fully getting harvested. And hmm. I think it's because people are spending more time at home and they're also noticing them because these bushes are not actually listed um, on fallingfruit.org, at least not yet. <laughs> I plan to maybe put them there, but. Um, there's, yeah, there's been a general uptick in interest in mm -hmm. um, just one's immediate environment in general, but certainly also related to local food. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I mean, you know, one aspect is just while we're traveling less to far away places, so sort of trying to find fun adventures near home. Mm -hmm. Also just, I mean, it's, you know, it takes a lot of work um, to process these, to make these things oneself. And so being at, if you're working from home, well, then it's, you know, you can work around, you can, you're much more flexible with timing for projects like this. Mm -hmm. So people started to bake sourdough bread, but also spend more time <laughs> foraging and using the, you know, the fruit from their trees. And we saw that also in the traffic on the, on the website, actually, there was like a very obvious uptick in well, interest. I think people are talking about it. You know, the reality is that we have fruit trees in our midst that are just left to neglect. And if they're neglected and the um, the fruit just falls to the ground, then it's really kind of sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and I would and I, and I would encourage I, you know, I would encourage you to go and knock on doors and um, because I think it's really important to have these to bring to have conversations about these overlooked you know forgotten um fruit trees you're basically bringing value to them you're saying hey this is something of value that you have i'm interested and maybe they'll say no and then you know go away but then think oh actually maybe i should uh make use of this it's clearly something valuable. right you Someone, might plant you know, a seed interest. for them yeah that's right um and you know and at best of course they'll they'll be happy to share and it might lead to you know other other interactions um so i think yeah, this is a great a great way to get to know one another. <laughs> get to know people in my neighborhood even. I mean, I, the loop I take is about three and a half or four miles. So it's not a small stretch, right? But I come across so many of those trees because when you're taking the time to walk, you notice things. Like we have plenty of blackberry bushes, uh, which grow along the both my property and also along the creeks here. The problem is they tend to be interspersed with poison oak. So you have to be careful where you're picking. Uh -huh. uh, and then there's quite a few lemon trees, pear, apple, plum, cherry, pomegranate, and a couple volunteer plum trees that are just kind of growing too much in the shade, I think, to really produce enough fruit. But I mean, that's what I noticed in my direct neighborhood. And when I looked on the map, all I saw was lemon trees and strawberry bushes that had been noted. And they mm -hmm. were essentially on public land or um, on the edge of somebody's property. I have two Meyer lemons in my yard, but they don't produce that much fruit yet. They're still getting established. And so I tend to glean from the lemons of my neighbors. Mm -hmm. And then I will take surprise apples home. The problem with my walk is that I'm not, you know, eight feet tall. And some of these apple trees are quite large and they'll literally be 25 uh, feet up in the air and nobody is doing anything to maintain them. So you have I a have a fruit picking pole or yeah, getting one. Yeah. I'm actually planning to get one and just make it a part of my tour. Cause otherwise these beautiful apples are just falling to the ground. And, and it's such a pity to see them just literally like become basically sauce on fall, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, the stain sidewalks. That I mean, that's sometimes looking down is as effective as looking up when you're looking for right. for new sources of of fruit. That's right. So, what is your favorite fruit to harvest if you go on your falling Oof. fruit expeditions? I well, 
Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard for me to choose one, but I, I can describe what my for, my new foraging routine has been in my new environment, I guess, um, here in, in, uh, in Zurich, Zurich, Switzerland. Right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe not necessarily in seasonal order here, but um, there's a lot of um, bear, like wild garlic, uh, bearlauch, um, bear garlic. So that would be um, uh, Alice Ursunum, I think. Um, so these are, they're mostly eaten for the greens that grow above the ground and they have this mm -hmm. really nice like garlicky uh, flavor, make pesto with it. There's a lot of Cornelian cherry dogwoods. So these are dogwoods that fruit um, and they have these little I don't know, red berries. And I've been experimenting with, uh, that's Cornus Moss, uh, I think. And that's, mm -hmm. I, I've, there's a lot of Iranian recipes that use them. You can add salt and just eat them straight after they've been kind of in the salt for a while. It's really tangy and delicious. I made jam, but it's a lot of work to get the pits out. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can put them in vinegar with mint. That's another Iranian method. There's this- Well, you mentioned a, mint. Mint grows that? wild all oh, over yes. the place. Oh, yes. Well, mint, yeah, of course. Oh, my gosh. Uh, like nettles it... for tea, <laughs> uh, hops for beer I've uh, um, right in my neighborhood. There's this really uh, neat thing, a chocolate vine, Acolobia triloba. It's uh, basically unknown except in Japan where it's a fall delicacy. It's a really, really strange looking thing where the outside is basically a vegetable and the inside is a fruit. And yeah, it's, it's very neat. There's, uh, of course, lots and lots of apples in Switzerland and hazelnuts and um, I, I harvested some walnuts when they were green. I'm trying to make my own nocino, so the uh, like the liqueur. Mm -hmm. um, and then cherries, and I'm doing some rumtopf, which is like rum and sugar and a fruit that you <laughs> age for kind of the holiday season. <laughs> I mean, it's just so much fun. Um, you know, this is yeah, this is my you know my thing to do when I want to. Not you don't need to go too far into the mountains or something, just nearby, but. Have yeah. some sort of seasonally relevant little um, little mini project. Um, yeah, you reminded me there are a couple of walnut trees in my local community here. And with walnuts, I don't know if people know this, I had a walnut growing up, but you literally wait till they fall to the ground. And so if they fall to the ground, that that the husk around them is black and it kind of peels away and inside is the nut, just like the one you would buy from the store mm -hmm. unshelled. Yeah. And so you can harvest those once they've fallen to the ground, harvesting them green the way you have, you have additional preparation you need to do, right? Yeah, the, the green, that's important for Nocino because you actually cut it like the undeveloped fruit you just cut mm -hmm. and soak into the alcohol. But if you want the nut, it's actually easier just to let them sit basically rot, like let the outside just sort of fall apart. And then you're right. left with just this dry nut, like, yeah, exactly like it's sold in the store, basically. I, I found a cache. <laughs> this was someone else, another species foraging and then um, kind of picking from their cache. Um, but there was some stuff stored in a, in, a, in a farm, a barn, and I had to go and get those things out of the barn. And like in the pockets of between the boxes, there were these big piles of walnuts. Yeah, the squirrels. <laughs> the squirrels were squirreling it away. Yeah. That's exactly what they do. And so I, I, stole, I stole some of those from them. I hope they won't mind um, <laughs> the use. <laughs> well, they, they forget the where work. they put stuff to. <laughs> I mean, here they are just so busy with acorns that that's what they go for um, from all the oak trees, right? Also... But which would also, which have traditionally been a major source of food yep. for, um, you know, human societies, but it's a work to process them. And, and you have I to blanch it a lot until the bitterness is gone and then, yeah. then it's edible. You can make cakes out of it and stuff. Well, more like tortillas kind of. Yeah. There's a, there's a kind of a modern method. So traditionally be like maybe in a basket in a stream or some sort of moving water, but um, you can also put it in the, 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 the flush tank of your toilet <laughs> since that's cycling very frequently <laughs> you have a little bag a mesh bag with the acorns in there um, i think uh, convincing people to use their <laughs> toilet to make food is probably a little further than most well, are willing the, to go it's the top part it's the top part yeah i know toilet. but yeah it's still maybe a little too close um i, I understand um yeah so that's that's a really great one though to think about because the Salinan Indians, the Native Americans who were in this particular area, acorn was their primary staple in their diet. Not incredibly nutritious, 
but also just supply the calories that they would need to get through mm -hmm. a hard season. And so, you know, made up a consistent part of their diet. I think it's so interesting that you have different uh, vegetables and fruits available to you. Of course, in Zurich that I hadn't heard of, like that wild garlic. Um, here we have, I think, plenty of like green leafy stuff. Like there's a lot of mint and, and things growing wild. So you can always, almost always find that. I plant basil in my garden and strawberries is my ground cover because I like, I like the things I plant to be edible. Mm -hmm. Just basically it. And I think if consumers or people just at their homes, think about it this way, you know, if you're going to take the time to garden, focus more on things that are edible and, you know, you can add spices that you grow in your garden to your soups in the winter. And you can add apples that you harvested from your neighborhood to kind of sweeten up some of those stews and or cook with your pork loin if you eat meat and things like that too. So it's um, there's so many things that you can do with fruit that you might uh, harvest from your local neighborhood. And really just thinking about it a little differently is what we're inviting you to do today. I also wanted to chat about one thing that relates to climate and fruiting trees. And okay. that is specifically the carbon sequestration of a tree rather than cutting mm -hmm. it down. And so I wondered what your thoughts are specifically about using fruit trees as opposed to something that might be an evergreen or something along those lines, just from that perspective. Hmm. I mean, my, my gut feeling is that you can't really get a fruit tree to be nearly as large as some of the, you know, the big shade trees that are used in right. cities for, mm -hmm. um, in, that are ornamental, but very ex effective at getting very large. Those would be a more effective for sequestering more carbon, I would expect in terms of, I mean, there's sort of more rapid growth. For, I mean, fruit trees tend to be slower growing and then, you know, not particularly long lived, you know, maybe like an orchard tr tree. I mean, and this is more like the mega, the mega edibles that I'm right. talking about that are really, I mean, partly because they're putting so much energy into producing these big, fat, juicy fruit um, means that, you know, they just don't live particularly long and um, they don't get particularly enormous. So I guess I was, I, for me, it's, it's not something that I've, I've pushed because it doesn't single out fruit trees or edible, mm -hmm. you know, food bearing trees specifically. Right. But certainly just like, yeah, more, tr more plants, more trees, like, you know, tear up the concrete, <laughs> plant <laughs> stuff, like yeah. make sure a lot of that stuff is edible because why not? Um, and, and then there will be that win-win mm -hmm. um, if we're, we're just, we just have more green space. And I'm not like, I don't, I, I believe in a fairly cozy urban spaces. Like I want, I think for all kinds of reasons relating to the climate, it's good to be, you know, like density is good. Um, it's, and it's, it can be very pleasant um, and very livable if done, if done well. And a big part of that is of course, having then a lot of a greenery where there aren't people living or, you know, shops in the way, like where there isn't buildings, a lot of that should be given over to, to green space and because we need that i think to feel whole in some mm -hmm. in some way i i live um in this interesting model that basically does not exist in the united states but it's very common in zurich it's um, these big nonprofit housing developments mm -hmm. so it's like a mega co-op 1200 people in mine um, and i i i'm in an apartment with my partner um, but there's also some shared apartment, you know, so it's all, all kinds of different living models built into it. Um, it's 13 buildings and then the whole block essentially, um, is a shared, shared space and there's gardens, there's playgrounds, uh, there's lots of fruit trees, um, that are, um, and like, um, herb, uh, sort of little herb gardens. So it's, you know, I don't have to go far to find some rosemary, some, some thyme, some sage, um, for the, for the soup. And, you know, that's, it's, it's nice because I, I get to, you know, I get to have this open space. I get to have my gardening and foraging experience right here, but also there's a lot of people living, mm -hmm. you know, right around me. Um, but we get to share in this really nice uh, communal space. So awesome. I, I really like the model. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it's um, where a lot of cities are headed to with living building challenges and things along those lines where you integrate more green space and it becomes kind of a live, work and play or recreate, recreation type mm -hmm. of facility at the same time. So I think that's phenomenal. Awesome. 
Well, as we prepare to close, I have to ask you, is there a question that I haven't asked that you wish I had or a thought that you'd like to leave our audience with? Hmm. I should always prepare one. (laughs) I always forget. (laughs) Yeah. Well, one of the things I have been thinking about is how I teach my children to think more about the open spaces and community and their day to day. Because I think even involving them and some of this either guerrilla gardening or harvesting from my local neighborhood is something that will keep them more engaged with understanding where food comes from and how beautiful it is that, you know, these bushes create fruit or these trees create fruit that we could actually harvest. And I think I might get brave enough to go doing some of that door knocking with them in tow, because Mm, I think it would be a little harder for people to think no to a seven-year-old and a four-year-old with a little basket all excited, right? (laughs) So maybe I'll just make that an event. Um, And also just think about whether there is a spot for me to create a community in a Facebook group or something like that within our local area to get people thinking more about this sort of thing. And reaching out to their community members when they have a plum tree that's full of fruit that they, they, um, that would otherwise create a mess in their backyard if it wasn't harvested and just asking people to come and do it for them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's some action items here (laughs) that people could take on. Um, you know, one is of course, if, if they have a fruit tree on private land of on their own land, they're not harvesting from it or they're harvesting just a, a small amount. You know, whether that's adding it to falling fruit and saying, you know, please, you know, knock at the door and they'll let you in, or that's contacting one of their local organiza- urban gleaning organizations. Um, and actually on falling fruit, there's a, a not a comprehensive list, but already a pretty big list, especially for the United States of, of those groups that I could point, point people to. Mm-hmm. And then otherwise I'd really encourage people to start to engage in their city in this way. Um, and you know, maybe that's finding that there really isn't very much and, and then complaining to the city government about it <laughs> and <laughs> expressing a desire for more, or, or that's maybe that's finding that there's actually a huge amount, um, and, and, uh, adding some to falling fruit so that others can also, you know, help others get started. So there's, and, and I, th- I, I really, at, at this point, one of the things I really get a kick out of it is to, finding new things um Mm -hmm. and partly that's driven by or that's that's fed by my my knowing that there's thousands of species so that i mean i curate i I sort of keep an eye on the map right and and there's thousands of species of of food bearing plants on the falling fruit map and in all climates or well almost all climates (laughs) (laughs) i think the one thing in antarctica is is like a uh, more like a free box you know but not actually a plant (laughs) but you know, there's so many things I know to exist, but m- most of those plants I have yet to meet. And so it's also this uh, interesting kind of tourism strategy, I guess. You know, show up in a new city, like, oh, okay, um, this is pretty different from where I'm from. Maybe there's some really, you know, to me, very exotic plants that I can go and uh, uh, try out. So mm-hmm. that's that's been a very, a, a really fun. If you go to the south from Zurich, for example, hop on the train, you go through a long tunnel under the Alps and you pop out the other side in the, the Italian part of Switzerland or Italian speaking part of Switzerland. And it's a Mediterranean climate and everything's completely different. And one of the things that's really striking for foraging is that one in every three trees, practically, I think, is a chestnut tree. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how it was like how it was in the eastern United States before the blight. And so you're just walking these trails in the wood and it's just piles of chestnuts everywhere and i think it's i think we think of foraging it's always this idea of like there's you know it's it's things are hard to find and there's so little of it and we're all competing and it's just nice to be in these whether that's you know in in the forest right out of town where it's just chestnuts everywhere or if it's in just in right around the corner from an apartment building just being in this having this feeling of abundance is really Mm-hmm. refreshing like oh this is accessible and there's lots for everyone and it's you know there's that's a good starting point for <laughs> for community building and 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 just having a, a good time so for somebody just getting started if they want to be a forager what would your number one tip be for them what would you what would you tell them like hey hmm. this is what i would advise you if you're just getting started i've 
the strategy that's worked for me is to really slowly add in my repertoire very gradually. So starting with the things that I know that I, I rec, maybe I don't know what the tree looks like, but I know the fruit, you know, mm -hmm. so going in, going when it's like looking up when they, when they're likely to be fruiting so that I really can identify them with a lot of certainty. Like, okay, this is an apple came from this tree. That's an apple tree, you know, like connecting <laughs> the dots, like going a step at a, you know, a step at a time, you know, in, in, especially in cities that have the tree inventories, this is also super useful to use these because you have um, a very formal source of information uh, that's very comprehensive. And so it's, you know, it's even like, it's like a tree gallery, basically like, oh, okay, you're that. All right. Uh, that'll be useful come the fall, you know, to, to have that, that know that. So I think incrementally making those connections, you know, going in the right time when there's something very distinctive that makes it much easier to identify, going with someone who knows more, you, you know, of course, then using other resources, field books, uh, the internet, <laughs> um, but, you know, this taking it slowly and adding on. And I think it's, it, it quickly pays off all, you, you know, you, you, you can identify one species, you know, when to go and harvest then you can add on more and you add your repertoire, uh, but you're already benefiting from the, you know, the, the most, the most basic knowledge is already yeah. serving you well. Um, well, my, my tips are basic. Get a dog, take it for walks and bring a bag. <laughs> <laughs> you already bring a bag to pick up your dog poop. So you bring a bag that's separate from that, that is basically reusable. And when you see a tree that's fruiting, take a couple home with you. And, and like uh, realizing that, if it looks like an apple, it probably is, you know, just because it's in the city doesn't mean that it can't possibly be an apple or can't possibly right. be a cherry, which is what a lot of the people that I met, you know, back in the day in Boulder, that's, that was their block. It's like, could it be? But no, it's the city. It couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're going to be poisoned. Well, the worst case scenario, it'll be a crab apple and it'll be really bitter, right? <laughs> yeah. Not, you know, not all, um, uh, not all varieties are created equal in terms of their <laughs> palatability. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you so much, Ethan, for taking this time with me today. This has been a really fun conversation. And I just want to encourage my audience to check out your website, which is fallingfruit.org. You can go ahead and visit the site. You can create a profile. You can add some fruiting trees in your neighborhood to the list. You could even just explore what types of food is growing in your neighborhood. So Ethan, any closing words? Um, go out, have fun, uh, eat well. <laughs> and hey, most of that fruit, if it's growing on trees in your neighborhood, it's likely organic. It's likely non-GMO. If you're eating an organic non-GMO lifestyle, hey, you're going to be doing more of the same. So I encourage you to check it out. If you aren't already gleaning trees in your neighborhood, it may be time to start. Now, as we wrap up, I want to invite everybody to visit my website, caremorebebetter.com. There we have an action page where you can discover different things that you might do in your community to just go ahead and make the world a little bit better day by day. This show always invites you to care more about a particular issue so we can all be better. Thank you now and always for being a part of this pod and this community, because it's my firm belief that together we can all do so much more. We can care more. We can be better. We can even regenerate earth. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.